Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Uh, thank you for joining me tonight. So I've talked a couple of uh, different topics over the last few weeks, mostly writing, uh, a little bit of video game knowledge here and there. Some people like it, some, a lot of people actually watched that video, uh, some commented. Talked about like uh, how the Xbox controller is going to be similar to the uh, PS5 controller, the DualSense, or the Xbox Series X controller. I said that's fine, you know, I expect two companies that are competing in a similar market to be close and we'll see if speed is better than power or power is going to overtake speed. Uh, that's not what I'm going to talk about tonight though. I want to talk about some very unique topics that happen in nature. Some things that we don't typically see in nature. Uh, like for example, we are constantly being bombarded with uh, how the natural world is uh, this kind of just and normalized place where only those things that fall into the typical nature spectrum or laws of science and physics exist. And then we find at certain times that there are things that, because there are literally 8 billion, <laughs> nearly 8 billion people running around and there's infrastructures that we live in that are completely uh, demolished what is known as the natural world. We have creatures that are just as adaptable to us, to our society. We have particular things like uh, certain types of uh, termites that eat exclusively the types of wood that we use. We have creatures that exist because of the type of materials that we use. So in that respect, there is not as many videos about the topic of like rat kings. And that's what we're going to be talking about, at least one part of it today. Uh, I'm going to splice in between these cuts uh, pictures of what actual Rat Kings look like. And then from there we're going to uh, just discuss how and where these things come from, why they existed, how they became mytho uh, mythological throughout the times, and why Europe is so fascinated by what is and preferably a Rat King or what we term as a Rat King. I first discovered what Rat Kings were back when I was in college, uh, mostly because I just was one of those people who didn't have much internet access prior, so I was just searching the web through Wikipedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, believe it or not, back then, and just looking round and about for all types of things that, you know, quite frankly, are the unique uh, sp spectrum of, <clears throat> sorry, had to move over. The unique spectrum of what is the obscure. Uh, AtlasObscura.com is where I pulled up one reference. Uh, the complicated, inconclusive truth behind Rat Kings. Uh, that is written by, uh, they've been mythologized for centuries, and that's written by Alexandra Asala on December 23rd, 2016. I just want to reference that. So that's on AtlasObscura.com. Uh, I'll take, post the link. Yeah, I will definitely post the link to that article. I, I'm just referencing it. I'm not going to pull from it. I'm literally just referencing it for you guys. And I will put that into... Uh, sorry, I'm just messing with it. Uh, my, my link down below. So, um, basically, the concept of the Rat King is unique. And that it's something we've never really quite seen before in our modern world but if you imagine a time where you know we literally took our feces and threw it onto the sides of the uh road and we were literally no indoor plumbing whatsoever which is shocking to me because even the ancient greeks had a form of some type of plumbing to get rid of waste but they all wiped their asses with the same stick and that's why most of them died uh, disease, disease, that's the thing, that is the commonality. We still qu couldn't quite get the concept of disease, virus, plague, uh, all these things were just tossed up as mythology. Oh, God is upset with me this week, so he's gonna, you know, throw down upon us this massive plague, where in reality, you know, the fleas bite the rats, the rats bite the human, it transfers a blood-borne pathogen, and then it kills uh, three-quarters of Europe. That's besides the point, though. Because humans, with our waste, and we've all heard this and the blah, 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 beating it down into us, we're just these scummy, nasty, filthy things. But nature itself is naturally filthy. And the second most abundant creature, 
mammalian style creature besides the great apes and ourselves on the planet is of course the rat. The rat is going to surpass us perhaps in survival rates that we've never seen. They can only live for three to five years, but in abundance they can breed 10 to 20 times faster than most humans. And I know I just touched my face during a pandemic. So don't kill me. Uh, we can then uh, say that the rat itself is one of the most abundant creatures. It will outlast us. It will outperform us. It is smarter than we give it credit for, hence why we use it in lab results. And it, it basically is also one of the most disgusting creatures on the planet. It carries more bloodborne and airborne pathogens and ticks. It gives us more diseases than anything on the planet next to the mosquito. The mosquito probably being the primary bloodborne pathogen uh, receptor for all of us. Uh, mosquitoes are probably going to do more damage to humanity than any other creature, big or small. Uh, the rat, of course, being still a fascinating creature. I, I absolutely love rats. I, I'm one of those people who truly thinks they are probably more companion-based than a dog. They don't take up as much space. Yes, they can be disgusting at times, but they use, they utilize their own urine and feces to mark it's uh, it's almost like us saying an email to another person. Another rat can smell it from like you know, five maybe I think I'm like what a hundred yards away, five hundred yards away. Their, their smell is enticingly stronger than most other creatures, only probably surpassed by the by the dog and the wolf, uh, respectively. But the rat itself is this incredible creature, and rat kings. Rat Kings is what we're really talking about. I might just do other videos similar to this, but I'm going to focus on Rat Kings. I, I, I kind of go into this spitballing. But in theory, it is when a bunch of rats in close quarters, if they are breeding in abundance over time, get gouged up in this huge, massive ball, particularly from their tails. But it can just be like they sock together. So think of like sludge, nastiness, like maybe uh, an old-fashioned sewing seamstress factory where threads and needles and so on can get caught up in theory. Of course, we're not there to actually see a rat king get created, but we do know of it. So it is literally when five to five or more rats, I think the smallest ever was made up of consisted of three rats get tied together by their tails, so they're intertwined. Now rats, as we all know, are a very social species. They mate in abundance, they, they feed in abundance, they'll feed on each other, they'll do really disgusting, horrific things that, you know, we as society would probably go, ugh, you know, because we're a higher thinking species. Or, but at the same time, rats are very communicative, they're very social, they're very intelligent, but they also get stuck in these oddball situations where multiple rats are just literally tied to their tail and they cannot get out. They can't chew their own, they won't chew their own tails off and they'll fight each other to try to not chew each other's tails and they'll die that way. And so some of the oldest and most abundant rat kings that we find are in Europe, especially during post or pre-industrial revolution. Some rat kings can go back as far as the 15th century. We're talking 1400s here. I'm sure there's very abundant ones that haven't been dug up from Florence or Germany, which is really where they're primarily based. And rat kings themselves are these just strange phenomena that just don't happen anywhere more often in actual nature, but they do in our version of nature, which is industrialized cities. So... Um, people will find these rat kings, and they'll, uh, you know, mold them up. They'll, uh, they'll, they'll um, find these mummified things, and they'll mold them up. They'll put them on display in, in uh, Paris and Germany. And they're just these fascinating things. I always found them strange, where like a bunch of rats are just tied together. And it's and what makes it unique is that it happens more often than you think. Like, oh, you know, if you were told one day two bulls got their horns super glued together and they died with their heads tapped like this, you know, in a, in a tar pit, 
or quicksand, right? If you told me that happened, and in this world, and, and the trillions and quadrillions and non-millions of ten times exponentials of creatures that live on it, that that happened once, I'd be like, yeah, the, the circumstances for something like that happening are, you know, statistically very low, but it's a niche. It could potentially happen. And being a fan of statistics, I find that if you're going to bet on Rat Kings and finding Rat Kings, you're going to find them more in abundance than anything else. They are, they are a sure bet. If you were to tell me tomorrow that this very strange phenomenon right underneath my own feet would be like there's 10 rats that are stuck together and they've been mummified for 30 years under uh, an, an apartment complex. And they're all tied together by their tails. And you told me that, like, some, like, you know, I don't know, twine did it. I'd be like, oh, that's never going to happen again. But it happens so often that we find so many mummified versions of this thing. It's almost on the brink of conspiracy. So, for me, Rat Kings being what they are, and it's literally just Rat King. That's what they call it, that, because it's just an abundance of rats tied together. I've always said rats are more a swarm-based or hive-mind-based creature. Yes, they're not insects, but they act and they swarm. They invade. They, they, they are organized and direct. They use urine, feces, chattering, chittering. They use all these things and markers to send through, and they act as a unit. And what fascinates me more... And I've learned this over the years, not just from multiple sources, but just from my own experiences, that rats in the wild are these gangrious, nasty creatures that have no, they have sympathy barely for themselves, but they're, think of them as like raiders going across the, the lands of like, you know, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. That's what they're like. And so what they'll do is they'll send the dumber of the rats or the lesser rats in, in the the, the colony, and that's what they are. They are a colony, and I know it sounds like we're talking in insect uh, terms, especially like in terms of like bees and and ants and termites and so on. But the joke is, the rat will outlast all of those things because of just how intelligent they are. They're not just a cluster of neurons; they're a full functioning mammalian brain that also acts in the insectoid style of swarming. So again, they'll take the dumbest rat. And they'll say, okay, there's a piece of food over there. How am I going to know if that piece of food is healthy enough for the colony as a whole? So let's say someone put out a shit ton of, of raid at bait. They, they'll go over to Tommy, Tommy being the special, you know, lesser rat. And they'll say, hey, Tommy, why don't you go over there and uh, see if that's tasty for us? So when Tommy goes and they eats it, he goes, mm, this tastes delicious, because usually poisons are slow acting, and they force the animal to become super dehydrated, so they're always searching for sources of water. So be when they hear this, I mean, when they're, when they're communicating this through uh, feces, and they smell something that doesn't smell right, or they'll mark it with feces, like, here, I want you to eat over here, I just shit there, eat that. So they'll watch Tommy. They'll observe Tommy. They will actually all watch the effects of what Tommy ate on Tommy. And they will understand that Tommy dies after eating, you know, Raidcon. Because when Tommy eats that and dies from over dehydration over the course of a few hours, sometimes it could be a few minutes depending on the type of pathogen, uh, the type of, sorry, not pathogen, the type of poisons being used, the other rats will go, yeah, we're not going to eat that. So the reason why you have to get new types of bait change every year is not so much because the the poison you know de, you know disintegrate uh, degrades over time, and in fact in, mo in many poisons it can. Um, that's a lot of the theory we're having with Rasputin, who uh, ate the uh, the poisoned uh, food, is that the uh, the sulfurs or the, or, or the salts that were in the poisons had had run their course and just. They weren't working, so that's why rat, rat uh, sputin's poisoning, for example, just wasn't uh, apparently uh, effective. So, going back to the times where we say, well, if a rat is intelligent enough to do that, and we have to change our baits out because we have to change their smell, we have to change their scent, we have to change that because the rats remember that the poison killed Tommy last year. Now, 
they also communicate that to each other. There is literally that type of communication. So rats are abundantly more social than even humans are. And that's why when I hear a story about wild, why is it shocking to me now that I know that rats are so, uh, you know, family-based, colony-based that it's not possible for a bunch of rats' tails to get tied together. And it happens so abundantly more than we think. It, you would think in history it should only have happened once or it was done by man. And this is something that has not happened only through the, the interaction of man and the influence of man only by, you know, having uh, made straight. I mean, so yes, if it wasn't for man, in theory, this wouldn't have happened. But it's not like a person was just tying rat tails together. Now, maybe someone and, and nobody was doing it in history. So the point of myth becoming legend and legend becoming fact. So... To me, and from what I'm seeing of that, and I, I really, really, I'm, I'm, I'm loving this article. And again, it's not influencing what I'm saying because I do have a lot more abundance on the concept of the rat uh, king than just this one article. But I'm finding it fascinating because it's showing vivid pictures of it, which I think will really be helpful. Uh, especially the, uh, and it's considered a natural phenomenon. That's what's fascinating to me. And if you understand rats, and you understand why rats, and it tends to happen more with black rats than grays. And black rats, as we all know, are a European model of rat where the, uh, they mostly were formed in Germany uh, or found in Germany. But there's, there's a million types of rodenta that, that exist throughout history. And only this type of rat uh, tends to be the one that, that stays that's, that stays continuously in uh, rat king uh, form. But there are brown rats that have happened, and those are usually found in Norway. The, the, Nor the, the Norwegian brown rat is probably the most common influencer of rats in America right now. Uh, fascinatingly so, they are very big rats, uh, not as big as our New York sewer rats, which are the black European black rodent, but or rat, excuse me, <laughs> but rodent nonetheless. So when I'm looking over this, again, I'm not really taking anything from this, but I do mention, I do think it's a good read, and I do would appreciate uh, being able to find this. It was written in 2016, so it's not that old. Uh, December 2016, so 2017 almost. So um, we, we find these things in nature, and we're fascinated by it because, well, we think of what happens in nature. And it goes with the course of perfection, like we are perfect beings, and that, and and species are perfect, and everything turns out exactly one hundred percent of the time. No, it's usually about more like ninety-seven to ninety-six percent of the time that things happen to go correctly. Man, it's the, those uh, those numbers seem to be going down. So, when I talk about rat kings in regards to odd phenomenons. And these strange natural phenomenons that happen throughout history. I'm talking they are 16th century, 13th century, 12th, 18th century. One as early as the 1900s that we found in Europe. Most of them are exclusively in Germany. So if you were to pick a country where you would go digging and say, where am I going to find the most likely rat king uh exam uh, or, or where am i most likely to find the rat king germany and there's so many places in germany that have had this phenomenon that it almost seems like it is german centric but it's happened other places like paris has had one uh and it's just it's mythologized but it, it does exist and Well, it, again, it doesn't happen in the regards of actual nature nature, but it happens because we inflict nature, but it does not happen because we literally do it. Now, there could be hoaxes to them, you know, like the, the famous mermaids or the jackalope, but it could be that, but I don't think so. Um, judging by the theories surrounding these things, uh, we find ourselves questioning, well, maybe in two months or maybe if someone, you know, searches long enough and hard enough, they'll find the answers. 
I've always said that regardless of whether or not a rat king exists in nature or if it exists solely because of human uh, human impact on society and nature itself, which I think is the point, is that yes, without humans, rat kings probably wouldn't exist. But even with rat kings existing, existing now, the fact that more than one has happened, regardless of industrial waste and regardless of the industry complex or sewing uh, becoming uh, the popular way of making clothing and these mass-produced places. I guarantee there's a million of them in China. I guarantee there is at least a million of these things lying around buried deep in China and other and other regions of, of Asia, Africa. Wherever a rodent exists, and they exist on all seven continents, all, I guarantee you there's a rat somewhere in Antarctica. It's living fine because we probably brought it over there when we built one of our science labs. We can't escape them. People say the dog is man's best friend. I technically think rat is our best frenemy. So we live, and I'm sure someone said that before. I'm not quoting that. I'm not coining that, but they are a frenemy. They have helped us in many ways. They have found our way across passages. We brought plague to the new world. There was no natural you know, enemies to dodos. There was no natural uh, disease to, to these creatures that lived there. They lived in a more simple, symbiotic way. Then we bring rats, we bring disease, we bring everything with us uh, from Europe, from Africa, from Asia. We bring it to everywhere with these cultural diffused areas. We tend to forget that humans have been trading, loving, changing with each other for the dawn of time since we all stepped out of africa what uh less than three million years ago well, a little bit more than three million years ago now but our entire history is with rats and so when we see something like this the, the so-called rat king we're then faced with well what's what's the problem like we literally create an environment where this species can get tied up by the tail not just once not just twice but hundreds of times and at least 10 to 30 of them have been recorded and you can go see them throughout the world so that fascinates me i'm shocked that this topic isn't as overly spoken about on youtube i'm shocked that this topic isn't really researched further because you would think that something like this would want to be considered either a hoax or just a mere coincidence and it shows our impact on the world especially the natural world i've always been a conservationist and saying you know if you can build it yourself or if you can do something with it yourself or if you can leave a lesser impact, not just because uh, a regulation tells you to, but because it's better for all the other animals. It's better for the rest of the world and, and their societies. And they do live in societies. You want proof of society outside of human beings? Look at no further than the ant. The ant is a colonized government body led by a hegemony. Uh, regardless, we may not like the idea of a hegemony, but they are led by one with a distinct purpose for the hive to exist. The hive exists simply because it must exist. The queen sits at the hive and has the sole responsibility of keeping the hive alive by enforcing its will and hegemony onto the other ants, soldier ants and all those worker ants that will protect that hive from other colonized hives. Because hives will try to kill each other. They war just like we do. Society is everywhere. We mimic what we've seen in nature. Nature does not mimic us. We learn from our natural surroundings. So when someone tells me that something like this is not just necessarily because it's coincidence, but it's something that we have impacted, I go, yes. In fact, it is not only something we've done an impact on, but rats themselves learn from us. They are one of the only other creatures in the world that learns from watching and observing the environment around them. No other creature really does that besides our fellow chimpanzees and greater uh, less, uh, old world apes and old world monkeys. Excuse me. So when we learn that we do have a connection with these things and they're just as vivacious and vicious as we are and they really do not care about the feelings of other rats they will do what is surviving 
They are great survivors. We should respect the rat more than we do. It literally nearly extinct, made us extinct. And we have to also then go and respect the fact that they are also one of the most amazing creatures. We owe them so much for genetics. We owe them so much more for bio uh, science and uh, testing brain tumors, doing cancer research. Without the rat in the last 50 years, we'd never have made the advances in science that we have. And I know I'm using this as a, as a soapbox to speak upon the respect of the rat and why we shouldn't, you know, we, yes, I mean, if there's a rat in your house, you kill it. I mean, we're not, we're not going crazy and being all hippy-dippy fun-loving. There is also the threat that this thing doesn't care about you and it sees you as a threat to its survival. And life, if you, if you watch something dying, like uh, a mouse caught in a trap, it is struggling for every last breath that it takes. And that is a survivor species. That is a apex species because it is trying to survive. It is using logic, strength, willpower, intelligence, community to survive. The true strength of humans isn't always necessarily in the individual, but in how the individual affects the rest of a, a group or a clan or a, a, a troop, if you will. A troop is probably a better example. So when animals that live in colonies, such as rats, and yes, I know there's probably another terminology, but I like to use the term uh, colony because they are a swarming species. I don't care what anybody says. You watch how rats react. You actually watch their nature. That's what they do. So when a rat is behind the wall, and it's behind your walls. They're probably right behind your walls right now. They're scratching. You probably don't even realize it. It doesn't matter if you own a you know, four-story mansion or a single you know, double wide. You got a t potential for rodents. They're survivors. They're one of the, they're not just survivors, they thrive. And they're the only species that truly, besides our pets, thrive in our own uh, environment. Cats are the only other one. They domesticated themselves and they are the number one ally against a disease carrying rat. Cats don't catch those diseases nearly as easily, but they can catch certain diseases that felines transport because humans and felines have had also a strong, serious back and forth over the last, you know, 5, 6, 12, 13, 20 centuries, you know, whatever you want to say. The, the cat, the rat, and the dog are basically our three best friends slash frenemies. And when something like this happens, more often than not, and it is not just a one-time coincidence or a two-time, you know, pattern, or even a four or five pattern or serial, where we have at least 20, if not more, documented, and then some undocumented cases of a rat king happening. We are then discovering that we impact in ways we don't even see. So who knows? just by having certain things, what we're doing to our own environment. Now, yes, the environments themselves are slowly dissipating. You know, the rainforest is going pretty much extinct. We, we help perpetuate extinction processes, um, yet we thrive every time something else dies. Yet then something comes along, wipes a bunch of us out, and we, we talk individually because that's who matters to us is ourselves. And then we see society that we need to somewhat have a conjecture of human thought and rationality by somewhat loving our fellow man, but also knowing that we can't always agree with and have a permanent connection with some of them, if not all of them. We have short-term allies and very few long-term enemies. But we always have the frenemy rat. He's our best friend and our worst enemy. He's killed more of he's killed second to more of us than we killed of ourselves. He's like the second largest killer of humans. Fleas, technically, I know. I'm I'm putting so much into basing the rat for the flea that carries onto him. You know, if that's the case, a dog carrying fleas can kill you too, right? So let's be fair. Let's be abundantly clear here. I'm not protesting the rat. I'm not saying that it's a horrible thing. And I'm not saying that it's a good thing either. 
I'm also not saying that these things, which again, it is literally multiple rats that have been fused to the tail by some type of substance, some type of string, and I have died, and these, their abundance sometimes can be like hundreds of rats, tens to 20, 30 rats all in a big bundle. Just the way they die, it's incredible. But you see that they're all flowing outwards like this because survival is the last thought of the rat. It is the one thing that keeps them going to the very bitter end. You ever see a rat dead? Unless it's caught by poison or trapped, it is always dying in motion. It is always literally dead in motion. You find a dead rat in the forest, you find a dead rat on the street, you find a dead rat anywhere. It literally was running or moving that last second it was alive. It wasn't laying there lethargic, hoping the end would come soon. It was, I'm gonna fucking live. That's what it was doing. And that's what you see when you look at an untouched one of these. Obviously, lots of people have, um, have uh, you know, uh, put these into solutions to keep them, uh, like, almost taxidermied or, or fresh. You know, they, they've use formaldehyde to keep a lot of these things as fresh as possible, especially newer versions of the uh, Rat Kings or, or, or earlier or later foundings of them. So when you see my passion is not so much for the rats themselves, but the idea behind what these things are, you'll see that I'm not just, uh, you know, vindicating that these things happen not only in nature, but they don't usually happen in nature. They usually happen more because of our impact on nature. So I find them fascinating for the sole purpose that very few other creatures live and thrive in that type of social atmosphere, except for humans, really. I mean, we don't have like huge, massive, you know, gatherings like this, even prior to the COVID circumstances. Uh, hopefully I don't get in trouble for saying that word. Apparently it's a bad word nowadays. But we we have these rats that are literally living in abundance. They they catch the but they it's almost like they have an instinct that they know they got a short time, so they're here for a good time, not a long time. Kind of that old reference and theory. So let's talk about the rat king one last time here before I close this up. Because I really want to make sure I touch base on every aspect. I'm sure there's somebody out there who's more of an expert than I am. I am more a fan or a, a, a connoisseur of it, but not necessarily a true expert. I've never seen one. I'd be fascinated to go to like a a, a, a museum or a, or a, a what is it, like a, a traveling like hoax show, they call those, uh, to see one. And to, to see what they are and to just realize that nature is freaky and what we do to nature is even freakier sometimes. You know, I always laugh, like, the abundance of weird, strange phenomenons that have come and gone because of human interaction. I mean, you look no further than Chernobyl, right? But these things exist simply because we have industry. You know, there's sewers, there's pus, slime, disgusting stuff. And they just get tied up. They literally get tied from the tails. It's like, you know, imagine just like a pig tail getting stuck in a in a fence or something like that. They just all get tied together. And their number one instinct is to brash out and try to pull away, survive. Sometimes you'll even just see like a tail where the rat used to be. And they sometimes do get their tail off of it. I've seen that on the larger one, where there would be sometimes more tails than rats connected. Now, of course, that could just be uh, they were eating the other rats to stay alive, which they do. They will literally cannibalize to survive. They cannibalize their children, especially if they notice, like, oh, all my babies are feeding, but that one little baby over there is not there. <sighs> done. It, it, it will eat it because it knows that as horrible as it is, and they do have sympathy for their own because they do care about survival, but they'll eat like a baby that's just not functioning properly because they want to, as horrible as it sounds, keep those blood lines pure of any like imperfections. That's why they don't get diseased as often because the second a mother rat notices a diseased creature or like a, a symptom 
that isn't uh, normal for a rat, it will eat it. So there's so many unique ways that rats do what they do. And rat kings, being what they are, these fascinating, I think they're more fascinating to look at than learn about because they're just looking at them, you get the idea, and you see the agony and the strength to survive in the rats that are there. Like, you, they're not just laying, like if you look at one that's not touched from what I've seen pictures of prior to them being Earth, they are literally just going outwards. It's fascinating. I think we can learn a lot from that in, in bounds of survival, but at the same time, their impact on the world is far less than ours and well in theory but i'm still fascinated by them i love them as as pets i think they're ingenious i think if you think rats are disgusting and you haven't looked at a dumbo rat or a fancy rat especially with those big ears a baby dumbo rat is probably one of the cutest animals quite frankly the cutest animals on the planet if you look at that little face and you tell me it's not cute because it's a rat then you're you're missing the point of why we think things are cute. Funny funny little side bit here that I once read somewhere that elephants look at us the same way we look at puppies. They think we're cute. And I I, I couldn't imagine being like a twelve foot tall elephant looking at this like half sized little chihuahua human barking at it with a stick and going, Oh look how cute he's so he's trying oh hey, hey, he's a nasty one, this little guy. He's a sucker, he's trying to poke me. Yeah, I couldn't imagine that's how they really see us. I'm pretty sure when they're stomping on us, they're not really thinking that way. But I, I once read that, and I'm saying, well, rats kind of have that, like, ew, they're so ugly, they're cute kind of thing going, kind of like one of those, like, hairless cats or that weird, like, Chinese starfish dog thing that's, like, all cut up, and he looks like a, like, you try to make it look like a Shetland pony, but it's more like a Shetland pony, one of those things. Yeah, um, those things are disgusting. But rats to me are fascinating, and I do recommend looking it up. I, I will put this link in there. Thank you to – this person is not probably going to like the fact I named him in my in my uh, video. Alexandra Osala from uh, atlasobscura.com, the complicated, inconclusive truth behind rat kings. Again, I am – I did not even read – one. Th if there is any coincidence, I did not ever even quote this article. I just happened to want to share it with you guys. And I'm only looking at the pictures. I guess then I am referencing it, but I'm not referencing anything that's written in there. Everything that came from me is what I know of Rat Kings and my perspective on the whole concept of humans and and uh, rat uh, socializations. So uh, I'm definitely going to share this in the video. Uh, you know, if you are enjoying these topics, uh, I will be doing all different types of topics. So I don't ask people to like and subscribe that often because... I don't think you're always going to like what I have to say. I don't think you're always going to like my style. I don't think you're always going to appreciate the topic I bring at hand. Um, and I might have not touched on this enough for some people. I don't ever feel like I talk about the subject enough because there's so much to say and there's so many endpoints to this because it goes off into why this thing was created. Why? I mean, like, what do we know about it? And there's very little. People think it's uh, it could be a cult thing, right? It could be like this cult of personality thing where we, we see someone who might have tied all these rats together for some purpose, some given purpose, and we see this person talking about something, but are they really saying anything about the subject? And so I feel that way when it comes to this particular type. And I'm looking over the, uh, the pictures right now. Jeez, they are so weird. I don't see the one Rat King in here, the really big Rat King that's like infamous, but there's always been um, – I, I, I did read in another – I think it was a Wikipedia article about Tchaikovsky's uh, The Nutcracker having the Mouse King be uh, subjugated to being in theory what we believe to be a Rat King. So that – even Tchaikovsky kind of talked about these demonic – giant like mythos creatures imagine like this big freaking pinwheel of rats coming at you that'd be like one of the most terrifying uh anapromorphic monstrosities i could ever imagine this giant ass rat thing coming at you sounds like a D, &D monster if i ever heard of one and I i'm fascinated by like wow these things are so cool but they're so terrifying and they're so sad they're just agonizingly sad like you know how how even in their short life, it's so short, you know. I mean, it's even shorter than the short. So, you know, they live three to five years. In 
in captivity, you're lucky to get them to live that long. Imagine what they live in the wild where they have, like, birds eating them every day. I mean, it's just a hard life for a rat. I feel bad for them. But then I realized they killed about three-quarters of the population of Europe, and I don't feel as bad anymore, you know? You know, they, those are some of my ancestors, too, I'm sure, uh, as much as yours. But, you know, we, we, we thrive with the rats. You know, and our time, in theory, is also quite short because we develop at a slower pace than any other species on the planet. Compare us to any other animal from birth to full adulthood, intellectually sound, uh, capable adult species. I don't think there's anything that takes longer except excluding maybe the turtle. The, the snapping turtle can live up to about 100 and some odd years. By the age of like 20, they're still like this big. So they take forever to grow. Alligator snappers. So there, there's, there's very few things that in longevity sake have a short period of time over growth and then a longer period of life after said growth has been fully affected and of course growth never ends that's why we always have the anomalies that happen to us even so rats to me fascinating creatures rat kings one of the most fascinating obscure things to happen in the history of the world it, it really is and it's so simple it's such a simplistic construct of a weird ass thing that we tend to forget that it is just literally a couple of rats tied up uh again look at this over um, look over this i'm gonna read it myself actually i didn't want to read it uh i know that sounds obscure and, and insane like how the hell do you talk about a subject and not read an article like i've read multiple articles over the last 15 years about the subject so i am well versed um again most of them come from germany it's actually a small region of Germany, and most of them are carbon dated between the years of like seven, sixteen, you know, sixteen, so fifteen hundreds to like eighteen twenties. That's like the roundabout. Of course, carbon dating is a whole other bag of worms that I wouldn't really want to get into. But you know, we do have uh, we we do have a great deal of unique things we can learn from this, and that. Whatever we do, whatever or not we think, oh, my house really isn't impacting the natural world and everything we do from burning gas to, you know, packaging food, we are impacting everything around us. Even as much as we try to disassociate and remove ourselves from that natural world and create our, you know, artificial society, we are still impacting us. And impacting everything around us on a grandiose scale. So I, I would just like to summarize this whole thing by saying that it's really hard to do the whole topic justice by just sitting here telling you what it is. Again, literally, there's a bunch of rats that get their tails tied together or get can, can, you know mucked up in some way that they just all die in a group and most times from... Not being able to function, obviously they can't get away from each other, not able to go and get food. They all die of starvation or they die of dehydrated, uh, dehydrated, uh, dehydration. <laughs> wow. More often. That's what happens when I don't start with a drink. Um, so yeah, we, we do see that. And it, it, there is more to it than that, obviously. Like how does it happen and all that. But most of the time it's all theory. And some people don't even think they truly exist and that they're just hoaxes. Uh, that, that's been one of the biggest uh, over multiple uh, sources have said, oh, these things could be hoaxes. They could just be like, you know, snake oils. They're, they're, just a, they're just an attraction to come see. But when we literally are pulling them out of the ground and even like, you know, 400 years after the first one was truly discovered, I'm pretty sure there's even further ones that go far back that were discovered. It tends to be interesting that it's just, I'm more concerned, like, how is this happening so often? It's so, so vividly, you know, it's just amazing. But I think that's going to be it for this particular video. I'm going to leave this one in there. And as you can see, we're going to uh, finish this up respectably. For more information on, like, Rat Kings, I do recommend uh, checking out, again, Atlas Obscura. I'm going to share that. That's, and, you know, and that's, like, it, I'll be honest, from, from what I gather of it, it, it's definitely 
also in an article written with some, uh, you know, uh, analysis rather than uh, just pure fact too. Uh, it's a factoid, if you will, if you want to use the some lexicon in this new speak that we have. I'm not going to say the, the FS word or S F N word, excuse me, because that's not what it is. But I do find it interesting. I hope you enjoyed the rest of this video, and I do hope you come back. I want to do a video next time, uh, and that video is going to be, I don't know, there's a couple of things. I like talking video games, but I'm so sick of talking video games after like 25 years of doing 25 years, oh my god, 20 years of doing it. Holy shit, it's almost going to be 25 years, isn't it? I've been doing this since I was 15, 16 years old. Holy crap. 2000, 2005 or 2004, I think I started blogging. And I've always done video games and books, books, books. Oh my god, books. Oh, I could talk for days about books and where they're going. But uh, speaking of books... <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not going to segue into my books. I've mentioned it too many times. Um, I would like to just say that the next video is probably going to be something different than this and definitely something different from the writing aspects. I'm so sick of talking about writing. I find that the majority of people who want writing advice don't want to hear the actual writing advice because it doesn't pertain to their form of writing. It doesn't have any true interpersonal connection. Writing is personal. Uh, I feel sick sometimes when I'm writing. I literally get sick to my stomach when I'm trying to finish something up and I'm trying to, uh, you know, pontificate a topic. I don't know. Lately, I've been like a uh, little, little foggy, so who knows. I'm, I'm probably just so sick of just talking about the subject of writing and writing about the subject of writing because... Nobody wants to listen to you unless, you know, well, like, why should I? Who are you? Did you ever get published? Did you ever have this? And even if you were, like, well, are you a New York Times bestseller? You know, you get those kind of people, too. Chuck Palahniuk just put out a book about writing and his process, and he has a really unique t concept. He's got a good topic. Uh, his way of writing is very fascinating, actually. And I was looking it over. I was reading a sample of it. I do recommend some people take a chance to uh, read that. Uh, what was the name of that book? Hold on a second. I'm going to pull it up. I know, I know. Uh, just off the top, but the, off the cuffs here. But <sighs> one moment. I'm so sorry. Give me one moment. I know this is where editing should come in. But you know what? I, I want to keep talking. I'll keep talking. So um, one of the things that I found fascinating with with the writing prospect that we were talking about last week is that a lot of people really uh, watched it and they liked what I said. Um, but at the same time, they also, I don't know, a lot, you know, 25 people, 30 people, and it's only been out for a little while. I'm sure we'll get more, uh, more people looking at that later on, especially with the, the amount of videos I'm putting up soon. So, Next week, well, I say next week, but, oh, it's called Consider This, Moments in My Writing Life, hold on, I gotta see the, uh, the cover, Consider This, Moments in My Writing Life, after, oh, God, yeah, just, just Chuck Palahniuk, Consider This. Uh, that's what you want to read. That's what you want to look for. Moments in my writing life after which everything was different. Chuck Palahniuk. C-H-U-C-K-P-A-L-A-H-N-I-U-K. I've gotten so used to spelling his name now. It's like crazy. So yeah, Chuck Palahniuk. I recommend looking it up. I read the sample of it so far. I'm a big fan. I think he's a little... You know, transliterative, he's a little weird, but some of the stuff he writes, eh, it's a mixture between good and bad. Poor and spectacular. So, next week's video, next video in general, I keep saying next week, but it's probably going to be sooner. Uh, that's going to be about, at least, eh, it'll probably be next week. 
Oh my god. I ruined this perfectly decent video. Anyway, <clears throat> we'll, we'll be talking about some other topics in general. I, I'm thinking of a couple of different topics, but I don't want to say one and then people get all excited and I do another. But it will be similar to something like this, except a little bit better research. I didn't want to research a lot on this because I, I didn't want to kill the flow of what I really wanted to speak about entirely about rats and rat kings. But as you can see, this video is probably less about rat kings and more about rats, but it shows you how it happens. At the end of the day, we are all trying to survive, and this creature is literally trying to survive. What it does is it infatuates and throws me a curveball every time I think of some weird shit that happens to them. And in, in anything in nature. And then I say, oh, wow, you know, look what we did. And then there's this monstrosity of rats that comes out of the nightmares of like Stephen King. And it just sits there and it's just like this agonizing ball that proves mortality is really just that impressive. It's literally flightless. I mean, could you imagine? I mean, for just a second, that 30 of a species literally got tied together in a way that if it happened to a human being, just because we have that amazing opposable thumb and that higher thinking, larger brain, that we'd be able to pull ourselves out of it where at least 99, if not 100% of the people involved would be alive and probably joking about it over a beer. That these creatures literally died because they got stuck together by their tails. It, it, it just fascinates me. It shows you that pathology itself is an amazing feature and it, it's just amazing what, what happens to things in general. Like life is the most fascinating beautiful yet strangely atypical thing on this planet considering the majority of the planet isn't alive the majority you know we're talking rocks we're talking well actually rocks aren't the majority i guess yeah let me let me mis i misphrase myself considering the majority of the universe is not alive it is not a living thing it's just energy pulsing energy now is energy alive that's a different question uh, majority of it being nuclear energy uh, and um, you know, electromagnetic energy. Then we have the energy we create, which is the combustion energy, the uh, heat energies. You know, those those are their own thing. But we literally make everything else interesting. Like we as living beings, whether we are amoebas. Which will fascinate you to no end if you just look at them and see how they exist and that they do exist and that even though they're a single cell thing, they live. Viruses that are living and non-living. And then, of course, like I said, lower life forms. Again, the rats survived the, the dinosaurs. It was the last, it was the first thing to outlive the dinosaurs. It was the last thing the dinosaurs saw. And the only thing that survived besides that were like, Bugs, you know, centipedes, they've been around for like 300 million years, things like that. It fascinates me every day that we are the finite. We are the minimal that this planet has ever seen. We are, we are new. We're, we're the new kids on the block, if you will. We're the new guys. We're the boys that are back in town. And how many other boy band references and uh, songs can I put in there? <laughs> but rats, rats are our ancestors and... They're our best frenemies ever, and they're the best kind of, they're the best kind of villain, really. You know, they, they don't really do anything wrong, but they, they horrify us, they, they make us sick to our stomachs, they're like the most terrifying, like when you see a mouse you, on your table, you think, oh, it's disgusting, it's spreading disease, it's, but realistically, we're, the, we're just as bad, you know. And that's not a push down on, on human beings. It's not. I, I truly believe in my heart that majority of us want to do well. But I'm just fascinated by every little typical function of this planet where we just, we just exist with these things around us. And we, we are grossed out by them because they live in the natural world that we have typically vanished from. We... Unless you, even if you live in the woods, you're not living 
in nature. You're living in this pre-constructed, pre-grown nature that's been let alone to grow over that probably was a town or something, you know, a couple hundred years before. And unless you're living near state land, you know, you're not living in the real world. But you're not living in the true nature that's surrounding us. But rats don't care. They're going to be there with us whether we like it or not. And we'll try to kill them off. We'll try to exterminate them with exterminators. We'll try to kill them up in abundance and they'll just come back 20 times faster. But anyway, thank you for listening, watching, and all the above. You know, if you really do like what you're hearing, please feel free to click like and subscribe. Sorry if I'm a little wonked today. I'm always a little wonked, especially after I've been talking for nearly an hour. An hour? Can you believe that? Holy shit, I didn't even realize. I just went off on tangents and tangents. Did you, did you learn anything about the Rat King? Probably not. Don't even watch the video. Go read the article, right? I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I hope that you you liked the staring at my face for literally 56 minutes. I got to cut this down. There's got to be a way to cut this down. Maybe I won't cut it. Maybe I won't cut it. But, okay. So, for more information about Rat Kings, you can check out any, any of the links that I'll provide. I think I'm going to just provide the one link, but. That link should provide multiple links to uh, different museums that have them, uh, different histories, different towns that they originate from. And I think you're going to like it. Have a good night.